Do you struggle with how and where to store your pictures, documents, videos, and other data? Have you ever considered a network attached storage or NAS device, but were afraid you need to be an IT genius to set one up? I struggle with data storage and I'm certainly no IT guru. And I'm here to tell you that setting up a NAS is not only easier than I thought it would be, but it's finally given me a single place to store all of my data and make it accessible to all of my devices, even when I'm away from home. Hi, and welcome to my channel. I'm Tom the Dilettante. And between YouTube videos, personal videos, photos, music, documents, and everything else, I've accumulated a lot of data and feel like I'm constantly playing catch up on storage. Let me know if this sounds familiar. You've got your hard drive. Fill it up, then maybe you buy another. Fill it up and buy another. Over and over we go. Maybe you're like me and also have external stores like these SSDs. But you know, for me, I still end up with the same problem, just a different form factor. And quite frankly, my data is so spread out at this point, I'm lucky to actually find what I'm looking for half the time. Which brings me to this thing, the Synology DS220 Plus Network Attached Storage or NAS device. A NAS is basically a storage device that connects to and is accessed via your home network instead of something that you connect directly to your computer like one of these. What I like about this solution is that it'll store all of my data on my network, making it accessible from any device connected to it. I can also set it up so I can access it remotely through the internet, making my data pretty much available to me from anywhere with an internet connection. Synology offers a number of NAS solutions that use a varying number of hard drives. This one has two slots for two hard drives. The cover pops right off, held in place by friction and these little rubber pins. Inside are two trays for two hard drives. For my setup, I'm going to be using two 10 terabyte Seagate Ironwolf NAS drives, which I purchased from Amazon. And as you can see, the drives and the trays they mount to pop out and then go back in really easy. Installing drives doesn't require any tools. Simply pull out the racks and we see these rails that pop in and out of place to secure the drive through its screw holes. Pop off both rails, insert the drive, making sure the screw holes line up with the holes in the rack, reinsert the rails, and slide the whole assembly back into the unit. They only go in one way and the trays have an arrow to show which way is up, so it's really easy to get this right. With the drives in place, pop the front cover back on and the unit's almost ready to go. Just connect the power, plug in the provided ethernet cable, plug the other end of the ethernet cable to an open port on our switch or router, and fire it up. My setup probably isn't that different from a typical home setup. I've got a modem and wireless router combo and a Netgear switch located in my garage. My work computer and wireless access point are plugged into the switch and the NAS will now be plugged into the switch as well. With the NAS connected to my home network this way, I'll be able to access it both wired and wirelessly. Before we can use this thing though, we need to set up the drives and software. The first step is to locate the device by typing find.synology.com into a web browser. If it's connected to your network properly, it should pop up with this option to connect. Go through the end user agreement and privacy statement, click continue, and then set up. Now this is my first Synology device, or any NAS for that matter, so I was prompted to install their Disk Station Manager, or DSM. During this process, it warns you that all data on the disks you installed will be deleted, so be sure you don't have anything on the disks that you need before proceeding. This step took about five minutes to complete and went through an install, a restart, another install before finally greeting us with a welcome screen. After hitting start on the welcome screen, we're asked to provide a device name and set up an administrator account. This is the account that you'll be using when you access the NAS later on. For update options, I just kept the recommended settings because, quite frankly, I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing yet, and presuming otherwise just seems a bit dicey. So, on to the next screen we go. Now it's prompting me to create a Synology account to receive more benefits. These benefits seem to include things like secure sign-in and access NAS from anywhere, and this is all stuff I want, so let's create one of those. I use my Google account, but you can use whatever works for you. Next, it asks us to provide a Quick Connect ID, which allows us to access the NAS from anywhere. This is definitely a feature that I want, so let's provide a name and hit Submit. This will give us a web address, or URL, to use to access the NAS remotely via the internet and a web browser. Lastly, we're offered a couple of other useful tools, which I'm just going to skip for now. After all this, it looks like the system is getting set up, and we're then prompted to log into our NAS using the administrator account and password we set up earlier. And voila, the device's administration screen. Now, like I said, I'm not an IT professional, and now it's starting to ask me to create things that I'm only somewhat familiar with. So despite my trepidation, let's just follow the prompts and see where they lead us. First, we need to set up a storage pool and volume. Let's create that now. The wizard provided is actually pretty helpful in explaining what it's trying to do and why. We clearly need both a storage pool, which is defined as an aggregation of one or more disks, and a volume, which is defined as a place to store data within a storage pool. Now, I'm using two disks, and here it's asking what type of RAID I want to configure. 
RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, and the different RAID types govern how those disks will be used. The Synology website has this nifty tool called RAID Calculator that helps explain what's going on here. In the calculator, we choose how many drives we have and what size they are. I have two 10 terabyte drives, so let's plug those into the calculator to see what it says. Underneath the NAS graphic, we see how different RAID types affect our usable storage space in green and how much space is used for protection in blue. RAID 1 writes the same data to each of the two disks. This is called mirroring, and it basically leaving us with two disks, each a direct copy of the other. This is good for redundancy, but slower on performance since you're duplicating data as you write it. Also, since both drives are a copy of one another, this means that even though we bought 20 terabytes worth of storage, we only get 10 terabytes of usable storage. On the plus side though, either one of our two drives can fail catastrophically and we still won't lose any of our data. RAID 0 is the opposite. It treats both drives like a single drive and writes data across them both. This is called striping. On a positive side, writing across both drives not only allows you to take full advantage of all your usable space, or 20 terabytes in our case, it's also likely to perform faster. But if either drive fails, you will lose all of your data. And that's a big con in my use case, so I'm not going to be choosing RAID 0. SHR, or Synology Hybrid RAID, is what I'm going to choose. It's advertised as, quote, a flexible storage solution with optimized capacity and storage, designed for the less technically minded, like me, easy to set up and considerably more scalable. The scalable part is definitely something I'm looking for so I can expand my storage needs as they grow. Now, SHR and RAID 1 provide essentially the same thing with two disks. We lose half of our storage space to protection. But notice what happens when we add a third or fourth drive. Since RAID 1 is just mirroring my disks, with four disks, I just end up with four copies of the same thing. SHR scales as we add on more drives. With four disks, we get 30 terabytes of usable storage with 10 terabytes reserved for protection. This is the scalability that SHR provides that RAID 1 does not. Back to the setup of our two drives. Once we've chosen SHR as the RAID type and given the storage pool a description, we're asked which drives to use to create the pool. I'm going to select both and then click Next. A drive check is recommended, so we'll select that. And I would like to allocate the maximum amount of capacity since I'm not going to bother with multiple pools or volumes. Next, we're asked to select a file system. I don't know much about either option, so I'm just going to go with the recommended one here. Finally, we're asked to confirm our settings and given one last warning that all data on our disks will be deleted if we continue. So noted, let's proceed. A short while later, we get confirmation a storage pool and volume was created, and you can see here it's going to spend quite a long time optimizing the drive in the background. At this point, we should be able to start transferring over files to the NAS, but there's one more step to do, and that's to create folders to drop our data into. Going back to the home screen of the Disk Station Manager, we'll select File Station, and see it says there's no shared folder available and we should create one. And so to create a shared folder, select Create and Create New Shared Folder. Give it a name, in this case, videos, and an optional description. Next, choose whether or not you want to encrypt the shared folder, which I'm not going to do. Then you have the option to configure some advanced settings like enabling data checksum and imposing a shared folder storage quota. I'm going to leave both of these unchecked for now. When you've confirmed your settings, click Next and finally set user permissions for the folder. I think by default it assigns the group permissions for each user, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to specify read write for my admin level users, my wife and myself. Once you apply, the shared folder is created. Now you can finally start moving your files to the NAS. From your PC or Mac, you should be able to just go into your network, Windows Explorer on a PC or Finder on a Mac, find your NAS by the name you gave it earlier, log into it using the admin and user credentials that you set up earlier, and now it's just like any other directory. My first order of business is to transfer all my YouTube content into a single location. And as you can see, I still have some network updates to do because my speed isn't that great. 700 gigs is estimated to take 11 hours to complete. Though part of that might be because the NAS is still optimizing the drives in the background, I'm not really sure. That's okay though, the way I manage my current workflow is to use iCloud or OneDrive to share what I'm working on at any given moment across multiple devices, and then when I'm done, I can move them to the NAS for archiving. So yeah, not bad. I was uh, worried getting a NAS was going to be technically challenging and over my head, but the Synology device made it easier than I thought it'd be. And no, this video is not sponsored by Synology or anyone else for that matter. I bought everything I've shown you today with my own money. 
But even though this video is not sponsored by any company, it is supported by my generous channel patrons and anyone who's ever used one of my product links. And for that, I humbly say thank you very much. You can find links for the stuff I've shown today and the Tom the Dilettante Patreon site in the description below. Thanks for watching, hope you learned something, and if you did, please hit that like button on your way out and consider subscribing for more dilettante content in the future. Until then, keep on tinkering, keep on learning, and have a good one. Thank you.